Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. This patient is actually a family member. Um, it's my aunt and uh, she's given me permission to upload this. Uh, this, um, I have encapsulated three separate visits. So unfortunately, my auntie is suffering from an ear infection, uh, more specifically, otitis media with effusion. So otitis media means a middle ear infection and effusion is fluid. So she's got an infected middle ear cavity and there's fluid buildup in there. In addition to that, um, she can see that she's got this a lump of really dry wax, keratin at the entrance of the ear canal. She's got a very, very narrow lateral aspect of the ear canal. So when we say lateral, we mean near the entrance. And I'm just using an ear hook to try and prise this away. It's a bit unusual because my auntie doesn't actually suffer from, usually suffer from earwax or dead skin buildup. So um, at this stage, I was unaware that her ear was infected. Um, but in a minute, you're going to see that my auntie actually has a grommet as well. Uh, I'm going to explain what a grommet is and, um, and how this infection occurred in more detail. Um, during the course of the video. So this is her first appointment. She visited me a couple of weeks ago. And now you can see we removed all the debris, all the wax, all the keratin. That's occluding the ear anyway. And that in the distance is her eardrum. This is her left ear. And there is a puddle of prolent discharge. So otter ear or middle ear infusion. It's got many different names, but this discharge is originating from behind the eardrum in the middle ear as opposed to the ear canal itself. If this discharge was originating in the ear canal itself, we will call that otitis externa, an outer infection. And that white object there, that is a grommet. I believe in America it's called a ventilation tube or a drainage tube. And so why do we have grommets? What are they? And how do we develop a middle ear infection? So let me try and explain. Now, the middle ear is the cavity behind the eardrum and it should be air filled. And the air pressure behind the eardrum should be the same or near to the air pressure in the atmosphere. So the air pressure that's in the ear canal. When the air pressure is equal either side of the eardrum, that's when we hear the best. That's when the eardrum is most mobile. So what equalizes the air pressure? And I'll come back to that in a moment. So this is um, appointment two. So after appointment one, I referred my auntie to her GP for some prescribed medication. And I recommended, um, actually, and again, we can't tell GPs what to do. So that's going to be very clear. So as an audiologist, I'm not a medic in the UK. And we're not allowed to prescribe medications ourselves. But I, I did give a suggestion because I have worked with a number of patients with middle ear infections with grommets and I've worked closely with ENT before. So knowing what uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Vajali, uh, who's an ENT consultant, would uh, recommend, I made the suggestion in my referral letter that it would be ideal for my auntie to be prescribed topical um, ciploflaxanin. So ciploflaxanin was originally an eye drop, so uh, uh, antibiotic eye drop. And it's been used by ENT surgeons off-label also for ear infections. And one of the, the reasons for that is ciploflaxanin is what we call non-ototoxic. Believe it or not, many of the medications we use for ear infections are ototoxic. And what we mean by ototoxic is if those drops enter the inner ear by the, the middle ear, for example, uh, or even if they're intravenously um, administered to the patient, if they enter the inner ear, they can cause um, a, a, a permanent hearing loss. So when you've got a, a, per, a perforation or a hole in the eardrum, which my auntie has, she's got a grommet, so there's a hole entering the eardrum. Um, most topical ear antibiotics can enter the, the middle ear and potentially then cause a permanent hearing loss by entering the inner ear. So we don't want that. So ciproflaxanin it is non ototoxic so it, it's, it's very unlikely to um, lead to uh, damage to the organ of hearing and or the hearing nerve, so the inner ear. And um, 
I recommended that my auntie be prescribed just topically and she tilts her head over to one side. So this, her left is facing the ceiling. So when she puts the drops in, it enters through the grommet directly into the middle ear. Um, and you can actually see there, I've cleared a lot of the fluid out, but you can see that fluid is trying to come out again from the middle ear. It's almost like a squeezy bottle. With, um, so if you've got a squeezy bottle and if you, if you tilt it upside down, you can feel that fluid wants to come out and all it needs is a little squeeze and that fluid will start coming out. And that's what's going on here. And I'm trying to remove as much discharge as possible. Obviously, I can't put the suction probe through the grommet. So the closest I can go is to the entrance of the grommet. And what makes it difficult is three things, actually. It's the entrance of the ear that's really, really narrow. The ear canal significantly narrows as well. You can see there's a V shape there. The width is quite good, but where the grommet is, the ear canal just narrows just there. And the grommet is hiding behind the floor of the ear canal. So at the entrance of the, the um, at the floor of the ear canal, should I say, near the eardrum, we have what we call an inferior recess. There's a little trench and basin there. And the grommet is located inside that inferior recess, which makes it physically difficult for me to position the suction probe at the entrance of the grommet without making contact with the floor of the ear canal. And the floor of the ear canal, in the inner two thirds, the bony part is very sensitive. And fourthly, actually, I've got to be careful that I don't inadvertently push the grommet through the eardrum into the middle ear. So if I put too much pressure with the suction probe against the grommet, I could potentially push it through, which is the last thing we want. So this is her second appointment, but um, my patient, uh, the, the, my auntie contacted me um, afterwards and advised she was prescribed um, uh, oral antibiotics. And again, I can't tell the doctor to do so. I, I asked my auntie just to, to continue using um, the medication that's been recommended. I also, after the first appointment, recommended nasal decongestants, and I'll explain wh why that is now. So I'm going to, while she's watching me clear all this discharge, and all this discharge at night, when my uh, auntie was laying in bed and tilting her head over, this pus, this discharge is ex being ejected out of the, the middle ear, through the grommet, into the ear canal, and it was collecting on her pillow. So every morning it was staining, even when my auntie arrived, you could see the outside part of her ear was all discharged and pus there. So bless her, she was, she was having a bit of a tough time with this infection. And so while she's watching me mop this up, as soon as I see three in the top left, I'm going to come back to the video and explain appointment three. Um, so we've explained what the middle ear is. We've explained that we want the air pressure in the middle ear to be the same as the air pressure in the atmosphere. And when it's the same either side, that's when our eardrum is most mobile. That's when we hear the best. Now, what regulates the air pressure in the middle ear is a, a narrow tube called the eustachian tube, and that connects to the back of the nose, uh, more specifically the nasopharynx. And the eustachian tube is under normal resting state, closed. And it's closed for a reason, because if you have an upper respiratory tract infection, we don't want that infection traveling up the nose, up the eustachian tube and invading the middle ear, because that will call a middle ear infection. So the eustachian tube is actually shut at the back of the nose. And it momentarily opens during the course of the day without us even realising. So when we swallow, yawn or chew, um, it's a, a, a voluntary response. The eustachian tube, the muscles either side, and it opens um, near to the back of the nose. The muscles are there. It, uh, the, the upper part of the eustachian tube where it connects with the middle ear is made of bone. So that's not really going to open. But the eustachian tube where it connects to the back of the nose is made up of cartilage and there's um, uh, muscles either side. And these muscles contract causing the station tube to open and the air pressure can equalise. Um, and whilst the eustachian tube opens, it can also help fluid that collects behind the eardrum to drain away. So it has got a dual function. Not only is it a pressure equalising tube, it's also a drainage pipe, a bit like a pipe we have in our kitchen. It allows all any excess fluid behind the eardrum to drain away because we don't want fluid behind the eardrum. Now, my auntie had grommets fitted uh, back in 2018. So I'll come back to that in a moment. So this is appointment three. This is my auntie today. Her ear was still discharging. It's been a week that she's been using the oral antibiotics. Uh, there's been minimal change in her symptoms. Now, when I examined the ear, there was less discharge. And what I'm trying to do here, I'm just trying to remove some of this soft, wet skin at the canal entrance. I'm now going towards the eardrum now. Please do watch. If you're, if you're up to... 
um, the video now. Um, you're going to see some really interesting things going on um, in the next 10-15 uh, minutes. Um, and I'll explain that in a moment, what's going to go on. But don't leave because this is going to be really, really interesting. So my auntie's Eustachian tube was blocked. Um, and Eustachian tubes can get blocked for a number of reasons. We could be congenitally born with a narrow Eustachian tube. Um, so it just doesn't really open. Most children do have a narrow Eustachian tube and it does widen as they age. And um, so a lot of children can suffer from middle ear infections as a result. It could be that the muscles that normally contract and cause the Eustachian tube to open have become weakened or paralysed. Um, or there can be some sort of obstruction, inflammation uh, at the back of the nose, blocking the entrance of the Eustachian tube. So it could be, uh, uh, you might have large, enlarged turbinates, sinusitis, rhinitis, nasal polyp, um, congestion there, inflammation, mucus. And my auntie had a uh, blocked Eustachian tube in both ears um, and um, it was causing her uh, great, uh, issues, ear pain, hearing loss, muffled hearing. So we tried everything we could to help unblock the eustachian tube. So my auntie used uh, nasal decongestants um, and also was prescribed some medication, but the eustachian tube just wouldn't open. So um, my colleague, Mr. Rajali, um, fitted my auntie with bilateral grommets. And what a grommet is, it because the eustachian tube is blocked, and because air can't enter the middle ear via the eustachian tube, a grommet is a bypass. So it allows air to enter behind the eardrum via the ear canal. And by having a hole in the eardrum, it automatically equalises the air pressure. The air pressure either side of the eardrum is automatically equalised because you've got a hole in the eardrum. There is no boundary, there's no membrane now separating the middle ear and the outer ear, so the air pressure should be the same. And if there's any fluid collecting behind the eardrum, it can drain out, just like what's going on here. So... Uh, in, a, in a silly kind of way, the grommet is actually functioning here. So when your eustachian tube is blocked, there's no air behind the eardrum, so the eardrum gets pulled in. I should have perhaps explained this. So the eardrum gets pulled inwards. It's a vacuum, um, similar to when you're on an airplane. When, when you're descending on the airplane, the air pressure in the cabin is greater than the air pressure behind the eardrum. And if it's a sudden descent, before your eustachian tube can equalise it, the as you're descending on a plane, the air pressure pushes the eardrum inwards. It buckles inwards and we feel blocked and we perform the valsalva, we close our mouth, pinch our nose, we blow into our nose, it forces air up the nose, up the eustachian tube, even if it's blocked, or a little bit of air even, and it then helps to pop the eardrum back out, and you can hear again. But when your eustachian tube is blocked, you're not able to do that. So the grommet is a, a short-term, generally a short-term fix. Um, the idea is, like, a grommet should be in the ear for around six to 12 months, and by the time it falls out, and it normally falls out by itself and it comes out of the ear by itself, whatever the underlying issue is with the eustachian tube, we're hoping that itself resolves. Um, now, my auntie is quite fortunate in some ways because her grommet hasn't fallen out and it doesn't look like it's going to fall out in, in, not any, in, the near, in the near future anyway. So she's had it for five, six years now. And this is the first time she's had an infection. <coughs> now... Um, I cleared as much discharge as I could, and then I just rang uh, my my colleague, Mr. Darius Charlie. I've got utmost respect for. He's an amazing ENT surgeon. He's my mentor. I've worked with him for a number of number of years, and I explained the situation. And Mr. Rajali was in part in agreement with me. He he felt the best um, treatment for uh, my auntie would be um, topical ciprofloxacin. In, um, eye drops, which are non-ototoxic, and we'll try and get it through the grommet. It would probably be more effective. The, there is a possibility that it, it's not this infection is not going to clear, and my auntie then may need to see Mr. Jolly, and there may be a uh, need to remove the grommet. Now, although a grommet's, in a way, at the moment, doing its job, it's allowing the fluid behind the eardrum to drain, there is also a counter-argument that the grommet caused this infection. When you've got an opening in the ear canal, you can get bacteria entering through the ear canal, um, through the grommet into the middle ear. Also, water precautions. Now, my auntie is very, very careful. Um, she did mention she possibly may have got some water in as well. And if you've got water in 
to the ear that goes to the grommet, enters the middle ear, leads to an infection. So grommets can, although it helps to uh, an infection resolve, um, if you've developed one by allowing fluid to drain out, inadvertently it can also be the cause of an infection. So what um, the plan was whilst my auntie was here, we wanted to get as much fluid out behind the middle ear as possible. And what you're seeing here, my auntie do, is eject the fluid from the back of her nose. So she was using an otovent nasal balloon. The otovent nasal balloon is when you inflate the balloon using your nose. It comes with a nasal capsule and you attach the balloon on one end. The opposite end, it's like a rounded um, tip with a hole. And you position that, in, in the case of my auntie, at the entrance of your left nostril. You pinch your right nostril shut. Um, if you're doing it up the left nostril, you close your mouth and you blow into the balloon using your nose. And as you're inflating the balloon using your nose, when it's the size of like an orange, for example, you, you swallow and it forces air up the nose, up the eustachian tube. And in this case, what we're trying to do is push, almost flush all the infected fluid behind the eardrum out through the grommet. Now, there was a potential risk that this grommet may also be forced out, but um, it was a risk um, after consulting with Mr. Rajali that it was worth taking because this infection is just, just being persistent. And by what I described to him, um, the grommet was really, really in situ. You can see it's really, really embedded. So um, there was a risk, but I didn't think that was going to happen. And we needed to get as much fluid out as possible because my auntie was still experiencing really severe symptoms. It was like she was underwater. It was painful. It was, it was embarrassing almost for her because she was saying that you know, she wakes up in the morning. She got all this discharge in her pillow. And during the course of the day, her ears weeping. I didn't want her to put any cotton wool in the ear to absorb that because then it, allow, it doesn't allow natural air into the ear to help um, aerate the ear to, to clear an infection. So we did this now multiple times. I cleared it and then I got my auntie to use the Otovent nasal balloon. We're probably here for about 40 minutes in total. And you can see that grommet is in such an awkward position because of the her ear canal anatomy. It's um, kind of almost hidden behind that the floor of the ear canal so it's difficult getting access to now again you can see all that fluid my auntie used the otovent nasal balloon she ejected more fluid out and every time she was doing this she felt better and better and better she could feel the fluid actually being pushed out of her off the out of her eardrum and she could hear things getting clearer and louder which is great And you can just see that fluid, it's, it's it's beating away and it's trying to come out and it just needs a bit of help. It needs um, mounted to blow a nose using the Otovet nasal balloon. And I've put a little kink there on the tip of the suction probe. Now, I find that gives me so much contro more control when I'm working up close and personal towards the eardrum. Um, it gives you a bit of depth perception as well, um, because you can you can judge by the angle uh, where you've made the kink. Uh, it just provides me with a better gorge of how deep I'm in the ear. Now, so with an endoscope, you haven't got binocular vision like you have with a microscope. When you're using an operating microscope, you're looking into the ear with both eyes. And by looking into the ear with both eyes, it's what we call binocular or stereoscopic vision. It gives you better depth perception. You, you probably want to try this yourselves. If you put um, one of your fingers out right in front of you, the furthest away you can, and you close one eye, and then you try and touch the tip of the finger with the opposite eye. Now, I'm sure you can touch the tip of the eye, but if you do it then with both eyes open, you've got much better depth perception. With an endoscope, unfortunately, you don't get that because although you're looking with both eyes, you're looking at a 2D monitor, although they are now 3D endoscopes out on the market, uh, but not currently, can't really integrate it at the moment with the technology that we're using with the eye clear scope. However, you can obtain depth perception using monoscopic vision. So mono, that's what we call monoscopic vision with an endoscope, although we are looking at both eyes, but it may well just be as one as you're looking at a flat screen. And you do that by um, using a, a, a phenomenon called motion parallax. So motion parallax is, uh, the best way to describe that is 
if you're on the motorway, um, and also explain, before I explain that, you can see again, my auntie's used the auto vent nasal balloon. She's squirted fluid out of her middle ear, and it's just collected in a puddle. You can, that, that's a great illustration there. And you can see all the air bubbles. And some of it's getting sucked back in. I think that's because my auntie, um, I, it was, I was asking her to swallow at the same time at this point, and I asked her to stop. I just asked her to blow into the balloon, hold her breath, move the balloon away, and then just open her her mouth without swallowing because I think the swallowing was it was it was the opposite effect it was sucking some of this fluid back in so we wanted to keep this fluid in the outer ear and again just be careful that I'm not going to push this grommet further in and it obviously don't want to touch that canal wall um it's very sensitive um where was I I was talking about what was I talking about here's me losing track um, it will come back to me, I'm pretty sure. Um, but whilst I'm thinking about it, I'm just going to go back to the procedure. Um, so you can see it was quite a lengthy procedure combined. And in between um, these uh, clips, obviously I was out of the ear for uh, several minutes at a time. So there's a lot of edited bits out where, where I wasn't in the ear. So it, the whole total duration was a lot, lot longer. Ah, uh, yes, I was think I was saying I didn't want my auntie to just to, to after using the auto vent nasal balloon, I wanted her to keep the fluid out. I've just had to rewind to see where what I was talking about before I lost track myself. I was talking about motion parallax and how you can uh, obtain depth perception with an endoscope by not having stereoscopic or binocular vision, but just monocular vision. If you're on the highway or the motorway and you're driving, and if you look directly out the window at the cars going past you or the cars in the opposite lane, in the opposite direction, those cars are whizzing past. But if you then look at um, in the distance at a building or a landmark, a tree, because that's further away, um, that is not whizzing past as quickly. Um, so motion parallax is when you use, you're judging the distance by looking at the relative speed at objects near to you and further away. And by comparing the two, your brain can tell you, it gives you a sense of depth perception. Also, with an endoscope, you can use shadows, ear anatomy, um, and it's all simply just go closer with the endoscope. The closer you get, the better depth perception you get. So you can see with that, we go really, really close up to the grommet. So... I'm nearly done now in the last couple of minutes and I think at this stage I was just asking my auntie just to, to blow her nose a lot more with the uh, and again you can see there's more fluid leaking out and I just want to get as much out as possible um, but written to the GP asked for the topical ciprofloxacin um, and we're using the eye drop version um, they, they are users off label by ENT as mentioned previously for infections of the middle ear where there's a hole uh, it's safe to do so you see that that bend also helps me to kind of almost rest against the bottom of the ear canal. Um, I'm using it. I'm just hovering over the top, and because I'm using the the underneath on the side of the suction probe, I'm not digging into it. So it's almost just kissing the surface of the floor of the ear canal, which won't be as uncomfortable. But there's no other way of getting access. I tried tilting, bending the tip of the um, the sucker the opposite direction. So I'm going from up to down but what I was noticing was with that kink with that bend at the top of the fine end it was grazing against the roof of the ear canal and it was also limiting my movement so I was trying to go further in but that suction probe was almost catching the top part of the ear canal and it was stopping it and then I was having to put more force in to, to overcome that friction and sometimes if you put too much force you suddenly break through the friction and that sucker you lose control of it and it goes far too into the ear than you than you would like and, and it's a matter of stopping it from making contact with anything so I found bending it in that way was brilliant that where the eardrum is you can see either side you've got white patches that's tympanosclerosis that's uh, calcification so calcium deposits in the middle membrane of the eardrum the fibrous layer as a result secondary to uh, my auntie having grommets and you can see we keep asking my auntie to to use the auto vent nasal balloon to see if any more fluid was being ejected there wasn't i hope you enjoyed that video guys take care keep well speak soon bye